What is up, down and sideways, you gorgeous individuals? Welcome to another Epi Up Lee Down by Karen and Mark here with you, beauties. We've got a week hiatus before the finals of the World Championship, but luckily, all these off seasons start early, and even before things are confirmed, sometimes that's my favorite part because then we can just wildly speculate, and there is no shortage of rumors and for 2025 especially, changes come into every region. It feels like playing one of those, you know, uh, Dark Souls games, coming across a player message on the floor that says, ah, hidden door ahead. But but, but where exactly is that hidden door? You got to figure it out. A little bit of every wall. And it leaves a little bit of that magic for when you do get that uh, reveal. You do find where that hidden door is and what path it leads to. That's how it feels, looking at a lot of these rumors, a lot of these places, players swapping places, feeling it out, trying to understand it. And especially, we also got a little bit of extra nuggets of rumors and speculation to go through, talking about where and who is going to be playing in the America's Conference, the brand new one for the LCS. Yeah, and now, latest and greatest, looking like we have the eight teams for that Northern LCS Conference, and obviously... The mainstay squads from the LCS we knew that would be coming in, except 100 Thieves have this little asterisk being the provisional guest spot, which really has no meaning. There's no context to that, but they sounds like we'll not have to do the promotion tournament at the end of the year. But it sounds like this is 100 Thieves saying we are a rental team for one year and then we are out of here very soft exit is the way that I'm I'm looking at this and labeling it for the 100 thieves it still brings in a lot of questions ones where there are you know are going to have to be answered and we need to hear back from the organization from the ownership itself as they talk about it because again this is a thing that's going to be questionable when you're looking at their commitment to riot in general their commitment to Valorant as the other big esport the one that they're mo- mostly geared towards at this point compared to League of Legends how does it look for you bailing out on this LCS type of one? Does it is it more favorable to do it in this type of manner where you're saying, yeah, we're taking that guest spot. We're going to leave. Hey, maybe we're coming back in two, three years for a guest spot type of situation when we decide to come back in or you know, whatever type, type of thing. I think at the end of the day for 100 Thieves fans and the faithful that have been there and gone through being called a hoodie organization all the way, the ups and downs and blah, blah, blah. This has been quite a journey for them, and to have it come to this point where it is that guest spot, to have that question mark hanging over it, feels unfair. It feels like it was a compromise with them and Riot to have to stick out this year so that Riot's not floundering, trying to find another squad. But yeah, what a journey for 100 Thieves. You know, hit the ground running. We're making finals. They've been here since like 2018, since that first franchising wave of new teams came in and quickly did build up a huge fan base. Obviously, a lot of marquee uh, players have played alongside there, but kind of put themselves right below that, you know, big three of organizations when, you know, it was... TSM and CLG, but Cloud9 and Team Liquid now in this new era. Uh, A team that 100 Thieves are very familiar with joining the ranks. We kind of knew that Rainbow 7, they are that premier LLA squad, get the announcement that they will be that LLA representative for the North. Obviously, fresh off taking down 100 Thieves at this uh, World Championship plan stage. And now we're learning that your boy Licorice already has a verbal agreement to join and replace Summit on this squad, so they're already taking an LCS angle for 2025. It was too perfect. You couldn't pass it up, given what we saw at this World Championship through the play-in stage to avoid having R7 in the America's North Conference. This feels good. I think the only thing that is going to be a little bit sour for people is we're not having Summit return to the LCS to have our rematches against APA. Uh, maybe he'll find a different squad. You know? uh, we got to find a way to work that type of drama and that storyline in there. I am happy about Licorice finding a spot that is one of those ones where someone that we have seen show out in the LCS and not necessarily get the full reward, get that stability that he deserves for what he has done in the region. So to get this offer, feeling nice about it, and it provides a little bit of extra spice to R7 stepping in as that uh, LLA representative spot for the North. 
you know Licorice is looking to sign a contract early after he got hosed <laughs> last year in the offseason heading into spring. So you know he was probably in talks immediately when it was allowed uh, from his contract. And then the last squad that, again, just recently announced, Disguised, going to be that uh, they're the promotion level team where at the end of the year they'll have to win and prove that they deserve to stay in that spot but obviously they it's like two years now that we've been talking about uh disguise team that came in obviously made a huge splash ended up winning in 2023 and then made the majority of the roster for shopify rebellion in the next year a lot of guys got lcs opportunities but this is the fan base that you want to see from these tier two regions getting promoted and we'll see what budgetary uh, restraints this squad has and what type of talent they're able to attract from a couple of the LCS teams that were ousted heading into this year. Well, that explains why Toast has been uh, playing so much league recently. Starting uh, jungler for DSG. <laughs> I'm not really. I'm not ready to go that far. I don't think the budget is going to be that tight for the roster where we got to be rolling out with Toast as the starting jungler. But I'm extremely excited about this. This is one of the things that we have talked about since Disguise Toast came onto the scene, since we had uh, the Challenger uh, League uh, team playing for him. This was one of the things that we wanted to see happen, that full level up, that promotion to that top tier and see what it can do at that top level of North American League of Legends. How that fandom can explode and take over is one of the things that we want to see, that commitment to North American talent as well is another thing that we did see with the Disguised Toes team. So that's where we're looking. And then that is that next question is the budget though, because it's going to have to be more than it was obviously down in the challenger team. That doesn't mean that you can't, you know, find your diamonds in the rough. You can't go on young guys, whatever, all these type of things to build up a budget type of roster. It's just that that budget needs to be at a higher level now. And that is going to be, I think, the question, I don't think it's necessarily one with a lot of heat behind it because that has to be more or less the assumption that you are being put up into this next tier. You are knowing that you need to pony up the next tier of cash type of thing. But I think overall, good move. Good day for the LCS, the fans of it, to see that a move like this is coming through. And obviously, Disguise did enough to prove to Riot that they're worthy of being that spot because we know it was just riot picks you know there wasn't a tournament they had to go through and obviously the fan base and they felt that it was stable enough urban organization to come in and fill out that last spot so at the very least we still need a lot more info about formats and things but it looks like we have the eight teams to kick off 2025 in this new look america's league last little bit of uh, lcs housekeeping because we're learning of this wild journey that your boy Jojo Pyun was going through in the offseason. Now we know he's ending up on Mad Lions, but he was in talks with Fear X, which was a thing before Cloud9. Uh, before he signed there, we knew this was a thing, but the LCK offseason starts a little later, so maybe he was a little worried he'd lose opportunities. He was willing maybe to roll swap top lane and join FlyQuest with Bwipo as a positional coach and... Go to 100 Thieves and quit his swap into AD carry. My man was trying to cook up all kinds of concoctions. Uh, this is the Nunu and Willump experience of just, they <laughs> threw the snowball down the half pipe and it's going one way and it's going the next way and then down the next way. This was wild to read and to find out all about this with Jojo Pyun on so many different levels that we got to talk about here because number one, we talked about, well, possibly being a top laner for FlyQuest, which is pretty qu crazy and having Bwipo be the positional coach for him at that point. That's a, uh, uh, someone might want to check with Bwipo about that one, finding out in these situations. And I especially know because Bwipo has had a, a lot of harsh things to say about professionals that aren't showing up on time, aren't putting in that full effort and work and well, why is Jojo Pyun not with Cloud9? Eh, we can leave that one an open-ended question to answer for that one. And then you get to the next one, 100 Thieves, possibly roll swapping Quid down to ADC. Jojo Pyun in the mid lane because, of course, Sniper is up in the top side and is that pro prospect that you want to develop. I can see a world where Quid might work out down in the bottom lane. I've seen his over. smolder. I've seen his Zeri. Exactly. We've seen, of course, very uh, frequent introductions of AD carries into that mid lane recently, and, and Quid hasn't looked out of place playing any of them. 
type of thing would be quite a bold move to make, and especially one that is, you know, uh, still puzzling to try and get your full grasp around it when you understand with the 100 Thieves now in the guest spot situation and possibly planning a soft exit of the LCS. Then we move on to the next little nugget, which is all the way across the pond, and it's talking about your boy wanting to go to the LEC. And it's looking at Fnatic taking a swing and a miss at him, already looking at Madeline Skoy, already had made up his mind, and the other little tiny one, I don't know how legitimate this is, also is, wanted to take a shot at going off to the LCK with Fear X a little bit too ah. early, to, uh, problems with when they were signing players, apparently. I'm not buying that one to the full extent of why that didn't happen. I think more so we can look at the results of this year and understand why that didn't happen. He saw Reckless on T1 and said, yeah, let me get some of that. Said, you know, Reckless played on the Academy team, right? Uh, <laughs> nobody told him that a uh, little bit of business. But MDK actually, of all those options, might have actually been the best result. So still excited to see what JoJo gets done in the LEC in 2025. You mentioned a squad that was in the conversation with him, and that was Fnatic. Well, the offseason roundup for the LEC, Fnatic and Giant X, and uh, they kind of have implications on one another because now we're hearing that Jun, as expected, likely to join Noah on Giant X alongside Jackie's in the mid lane. And let me tell you, Mark, if they get Yankos on this squad, I'm legit hyped about this roster. I'm sold. I'm sold. I don't even need Yankos at this point, but Yankos would push it over the top. No question what you're looking at with this Giant X roster, the upgrades that would be going through. Jun stepping in, what he's going to be able to do there, what he, how he can, you know, gel into this team. That's going to be something that we still need to see. But as far as on paper, the upgrade, the talent, the skill that should be able to be there for this Giant X team, it is that move up. And the reactionary move for this one is expected to be with Jun moving over. Well, that almost only leaves someone like Upset Mickey to be the bot lane for Fnatic. Now there could be. There still is the chance of a total wild card of going even younger, going into ERL, whatever type of thing. I would put the money on Upset and Mickey at this point for what Fnatic wants to do, what the remaining pieces of this roster is, and how you're at, what your aspirations have to be. The only two options that can fit and actually have a chance to reach that is Upset and Mickey. And, you know, seeing Noah and Jin go over to Giant X, I think most people are saying, great, awesome signings out of Giant X. And even if they are replaced by Upset and Mickey, Upset and Mickey are two iconic EU players. I know people are saying Upset is washed now. Mickey had a bad world, but that's still a premier bot lane that have actually been trying to play together for years at this point. But the bigger issue when you look at Fnatic now with the new bot lane is the bot lane wasn't really the issue for a lot of the struggles that we got out of them. Does Mickey, a veteran shot caller, and Upset, who had to step into shot calling roles on Carmine Corp, did two new veteran voices come in, solve some of the issues for Fnatic? I, I think they can, because again, part of the problems with Fnatic is the decision making that came through in a lot of these situations. There is, you know, a handful of moments that you can kind of put on either of Noah and Jun being, you know, big time mistakes at crucial moments for the team as well that you might expect or hope, or, you know, roll out different with upset and Mickey down in the bottom lane. But I think as far as the shot calling and the creativity that at very least Mickey is going to bring to the team is going to be an upgrade, is going to be a different edge, different angle and advantage for this Fnatic team but it all comes down to the two core pieces for me, Razork and Humanoid. And I think it's a little bit more so on Humanoid. This point in time, we've been kind of flip-flopping between which two, uh, which of that two is really responsible for that leading charge, that lead, that real steering direction for this team. I think it's Humanoid. And when he isn't right, that is a bigger problem for this team. Oscar, we want to see more development, more stability from him as well, but I think that is going to be something I'm not expecting to see. So we got to be getting it from someone else. And that has to be Humanoid rising up and this new shot calling that will be coming in most likely with Upset Mickey to have an effect on the team. I think the last year or two, Humanoid's been able to, you know, coast a little bit. Hasn't been fully tested. The mid lane pool in EU hasn't quite been what it has in years past. So he's been able to be top three. 
even when he's not playing at the highest level, but Jackie's on the rise in the mid lane. Jojo Pion coming over. I feel like those two alone are going to make it not so easy for Humanoid to be playing at a top three level if he has, you know, massive slumps like we've seen at times in both 2023 and again here in 2024. So uh, lots of spicy moves in the LEC and Fnatic definitely so many times I feel like we just have a lock that they're the second best team in EU behind G2. That's not the case going into this year. Well, that's pretty much the humanoid syndrome of being yeah. one of these things. Locked right behind G2. Locked right behind someone like Caps. Yeah, he says, I'll never be better than Caps, but I, I can be right here. Right? But, but I'm better than all these other guys, right? That type of thing. Ain't going to be the case this time around if you are not on your game. Especially knowing that, yes, I think a lot of people still are going to be uh, some haters, some doubters of JoJo Pyun. And, of course, the whole Mad Lion situation I think this is an incredibly hungry player with a lot of talent that has a lot to prove to the community globally and in that LEC specifically as this import coming over from the LCS. I would be betting on to see the, the mid lane explosion for the European region. Yeah, and listen, Elioia and JoJo are going to be an absolute, hopefully, treat to watch as that mid-jungle duo. No, we said the same thing about him and Blabber and the... <laughs> explosiveness never came to be but a fresh start for jojo across the pond over in mdk lcs and lec they look crazy whatever this offseason is going to be like mainly because of the new formats the lck is no exception but this is going to be the craziest offseason in a long time in korea and that is because the three top dogs we're talking genji hanwa life and T1, regardless of how the World Championship Finals plays out, T1 is in this conversation because everybody on T1 but Faker, their contracts are up at the end of this year. Gen G, all five members' contracts are up at the end of this season. Hanwha Life, it's only Doran and Viper whose contracts are up, but I feel like we're going to see an absolute mess of star players from these top three teams swapping musical chairs all around within the lck maybe some going to the lpl you know when you play a sports video game and you hit the the fantasy draft button this is essentially as close as you're gonna get to that in the lck at this point with the quality of players and the amount of quality players available to get at for all these teams the holes that they want to fill the holes they want to Upgrade on their roster, things like that. You're going to have a ton of options. And that is where it gets real spicy in the LCK. You already laid it out. The big one for me, T1. The T1 exodus, we all knew it was going to happen. Regardless of how the results will play out, there is no real possibility to lock down this roster a full second time around. We didn't think it happened the first time. Exactly. And so to think that we can get it a second time around, especially a second time around, given the climate of what has happened in League of Legends, the other teams, the other regions, how much they will want these players, that legacy that is being built, being in another world championship finals. Yes, they are going to be hot tickets and there will be no way T1 can keep all of them in their hands. I think it would be incredibly foolish to try and keep all of them in your hands at this point. You need to prioritize one or two of these extra pieces to keep alongside Faker, and then you need to fill out the rest, so either if that's from the Academy scene or still free agents as well. That has to be T1's plan. And if that's T1's plan, that does mean one or two of these guys escape. They get out of here. They're not uh, escape is, is not really the right way to phrase it from T1 type of thing. But they get will blown to the wind to be picked up by another team. A, you know, a seed blown away to blossom somewhere yeah. else type of situation. Spread the love of the LCK. Who's it going to be? Who's going to be looking to pick it up? And when you're talking about the other two top teams, Gen G and Hanwha Life, those are the players they need to prioritize and they need to look at. And I think for both of them, it's different. If you are Gen G, I'm calling Kyria. I'm calling Kyria, and I'm not stopping calling Kyria because that is the player that you need to add that has the X factor from T1 that can be a missing piece for your organization. What you have with Chovy doesn't matter. Pays, Ruler, whoever's going to be down in that bottom lane alongside him is going to be fantastic. Kyria and Canyon working together, if you're able to lock that one down again on the resign, that would be something I would love to see. 
Or how about you're saying, okay, we want Kyria, T1, how you doing? And T1 says, yeah, for sure. Give us Canyon. Because I think Zeus and Owner are probably on the bottom of the totem pole for T1 in terms of re-signing. And listen, they'd love to re-sign everybody. Everyone is fantastic on T1. Everyone is going to get a payday, whether or not it's on T1. But, I mean, maybe Canyon going over to play alongside Faker, arguably the two goats in their respective roles? Holy, that would be that would be something really special. And I think the important thing as well uh, is, you know, talking about these players and what they can bring so much of it. Right. You talk about all these different X factors that make up T1. Well, what about the time where Faker wasn't there? The biggest of X factors for T1 and it was Poby and they struggled. So there still is going to be that question, going to be that doubt of can you do it away? from Faker, which can be a driving force for some of these players and what they want to do in their different opportunities. When you look at Zeus and owner, well, for me, Zeus is the prize target of Hanwha life because Doran's contract is up and that is has to be where you're going. Yes, we know Doran is Zeus's father in the LCK, but that all changes when you step outside of the domestic battles. It seems he is a different beast. He is able to hit a different high and operate at a different level for them. And when you already have what you have as Hanwha life, that has to be what you want to add from the T1 dynasty. If, if you're looking at must keeps, obviously Faker's already locked through. Guma is probably the next close with Kyria for who T1 absolutely will keep. If you're Gen G, it's still gotta be Chovy. I mean, I know he's already been there two years, but you're not getting an upgrade across any player, regardless of all the international choking memes that have come out of him. But there's only one or two guys on these top three teams. You throw in Ruler's going to be a free agent, and there's going to be a lot of cash moolah being thrown around in the LCK. But this is only the beginning of what I'm sure will be a wave of rumors over there in South Korea. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.